Hello, Radio Free Scaro listeners. Stephen here with some archive content in the lead up to our three part mini scope on the works of director Rachel Talalay. Rachel has been a friend to us here at RFS, appearing no fewer than six times, and we thought it was worth re releasing our interviews and commentaries with her over the years as a lead in to our conversations about her work on Doctor Who. Back in the spring of 2016, Rachel Talley joined us to participate in director's commentaries for both Heaven Sent and Hellbent on Radio Free Scarrow episodes 533 and 534. Here now is the commentary for Heaven Sent. Welcome back to the commentary portion of the podcast where I'm joined by Warren. Hello, Warren. Hello, hello. And uh, for heaven sent, um, one of the great episodes of Doctor Who of all time, there's only one person who we could conceivably ask to talk about it, and it's the director, Rachel Talley. Hello, Rachel. Hi. Uh, how many times have you seen this episode? In, and in how many versions? <laughs> yes, and how many versions throughout the in- incarnation of this thing? I don't know how to answer that. I mean, uh, uh, people who know about directors, I mean, the number of times you watch anything in an editing room is massive, but I have to say that we didn't re-edit hundreds of times. I mean, they were quite pleased with the first cut. And so um, the uh, getting into a locked cut wasn't actually that hard, but um, in comparison to many shows. But um, then you have to watch it two billion times for effects and sound and music and all the... So a lot is the answer. <laughs> gotcha. How many, how many times have you actually watched it in its completed form without like in an edit suite, just sort of like watching it on TV or something like that? Oh, I don't think I... Oh, no, never. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a first in a way. Yeah, I really wanted to be a galley one to... to do this so it's good to have a second chance for because i miss that but no just sitting down and watching it um there's a point at which you need at least 10 years between finishing your work and and sitting down and watching it again and then reevaluating what worked and didn't mm, well hopefully but i can watch pieces i mean i've watched pieces and i've had to put together um uh, a reel for different uh, award ceremonies and things like that. So um, I've, I've looked at bits and pieces, but not at, not the whole. Well, this will this will be very exciting for all of us then. Uh, hopefully you won't find too many nits to pick as, uh, as people who have watched over something they've done a million times uh, tend to do. So I'm sure we'll all enjoy it. Uh, anyway, I assume everyone has their legally purchased download, Blu-ray, DVD, VHS, yep. VHS. Betacam, SP <laughs> copies, good... Then we are about to watch Heaven Sent in three, two, one, play. Boom. So thankfully, the the um, the the BBC actually put the script for this and, and Hell Bent online. Yes. And you can tell how it how it really kind of veers off after this this opening this opening shot. But how did you sort of? prep and, and plan for what shots you were going to use during this opening um, speech? Well, it was, this was one of the big challenges, probably the first 10 pages of the script. And it's worth taking a look at what Stephen wrote um, and how we had to uh, come up with a, concepts for, because almost every line of the script was so complex. And, and I've said this before, but um, that coming up with decisions on how to do every piece was just tr- uh, a, a tremendous challenge. Mm-hmm. And so we, there were hundreds and hundreds of versions of what we could have done here. Um, but the genius of the editor, Will Oswald, uh, to come up with a version that didn't, that basically stayed fairly, um, uh, the, we didn't do masses of changes. There was definitely the debate that you didn't need that opening bit at all. Mm-hmm. And we fought very hard to keep it, that it set up the poetry of the episode. Um, there was some argument that you should just come straight into the extraction chamber and see um, uh, the doctor created immediately. And we um, fought quite hard that Stephen's, the poetry of what Stephen wrote at the beginning, plus the visuals, set you up for something that was a different type of episode. 
Mm-hmm. Well, and it's a real reward the second time you watch it too, because it you know it doesn't mean a whole lot other than some cool visuals the first time. Second time you know what the deal is, and it just adds that much more to it. Yeah, and one thing that was was cut out there you barely see Bird. Um, where it's actually in the script, it, it it looks like he's about to write it, and it's actually written in you know in bold, B I R. He's about to bite bird. Was that also a choice in editing to sort of cut that out, and make make it a little more ambiguous? No, he that was in the script. Okay. It was, Stephen was very specific about um, what he wanted the um, uh, where to give what away when. Mm-hmm. Now I want to say that um, the what I call the hero speech, which is "I'm coming to get you, and I'll never ever stop." Uh, Stephen did not have the titles come there, and no. from the minute from the minute that I read it, um, I felt like that has this is a huge hero moment, and the titles need to come in here. But we played around a lot with whether that was the right choice, and even in the end, um, we put them back where he had scripted them, which was later. And even at the very end, Stephen said, I'm not sure which is the, uh, it, I mean, one can argue both ways with it. And that's what's really interesting about editing, of course, is that um, sometimes there isn't a right and a wrong. There's just a different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But for me, I, 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 I contend still that it was the right place for the titles to come. You wanted to end on, you wanted to punctuate that I'll never, ever stop. Yeah, because they come on when the doc, like two or three minutes after this, this scene is when in the script, the the opening credits actually come in. Yeah. And Moffat does have this thing for really long pre-title sequences. Now, now this part's close because in the script it says that there's, they they pan along the lines because you can actually see them in one shot. Right. So we did. Yeah. Yeah, we did shoot that, and I always read that as it's just another incredibly creepy thing going on in this world, that he said it, and now the, what he said is written on the walls. But the length of this section and asking the audience to reread what um, they've already heard, when we came to editing, it just felt like it burdened, and you wanted to get to the the scary stuff you wanted to move the story on so um that's why we didn't keep that idea in there Mm -hmm. all the exteriors are cg right like there's no bits and pieces of castles you picked up i mean i'm sure there's augmentation but was it all cg or was it just bits of cg there's bits and pieces that we did at um carefully castle especially the doctor by the moat we did with a, a drone but um, 98% CG. Mm-hmm. And a combination of, I mean, we spend a lot of time coming up with castle ideas. And, and um, now this idea that this piece here, this idea that the veil is, uh, has a camera and is showing the doctor himself and doing that visually is such a complicated idea in Mm -hmm. terms of a visual representation. And we spend a lot of time trying to say, how clear is this, how clear is this, how clear is this? We also spend a lot of time trying to figure out what does the veil's vision look like? What does his camera vision look like? Does it have to be one? And we only came up with making it black and white at the last minute in the grade. Um, So just question after question after question about this. Now the the corridor, I mean, I w- really wanted German expressionism in terms of the look for the piece. Stephen said, make it beautiful, make it scary. And for me, scary meant hard shadows. Castles normally have, uh, are sh- that don't have any source light, um, are lit with candles and are lit in a very soft fashion. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to figure out how to keep it from looking soft. So the shadows are, and they're all incorrectly positioned, the shadows, just to make it look cool. Um, driving the, everyone crazy, but actually giving the, the show a much more distinctive visual feel. And then there was the question of the veil, which was how do you make something that you can run away from scary? And I first questioned 
can something that's slow moving be constantly be be scary if he can run away every time he sees it and Stephen rightly said but the idea is we just have to keep the dread there at all times something that never ever ever stops and it takes a while to build up that idea that it's never you, you, it's never ever ever going to stop mm-hmm. and so it took me a while to get my head i mean coming sort of from the horror film world to get my head around this idea of dread rather than just attack and um absolutely right on steven's from steven's standpoint that i mean absolutely embracing that once i understood what we were aiming for visually and having to design something because he didn't really it wasn't that specific in terms of the design ideas um so the having to come up as always with the monsters with something that's really scary but um different and this idea that the uh, there that there's no face it's a very doctor who thing there's no eyes there's no mouth in this case there's an empty hole inside and pushing for that idea um and also having something that's white and trying to make that scary did it have to be white was that was that uh, was that in the script or was that um sort of what you're going as a, almost as a contrast to what capaldi's wearing uh, no, it was scripted as the, these veils. So the idea that these veils were were white and like a beekeeper. He scripted like a beekeeper's uh, mask, actually, mm-hmm. to start with. And we were ex- we expanded on that very much with, with Stephen. I mean, throwing out ideas and then him throwing ideas back. Um, the flies were a big challenge because they're very expensive to do CGI. We... Knitted, we uh, had plastic flies. We tested flying plastic flies around. We put them into the costume. We had real flies. We put real flies on green screen. <laughs> we had the uh, online people do CG flies because 3D flies were too expensive. Um, every little thing in the script had its own serious challenges. This painting should be up for... Um sale on <laughs> I'm surprised it's not a print on a t-shirt to be honest with you yeah um, I'm, I'll be interested in seeing what Doctor Who Experience does for this series oh yeah yeah because uh, they haven't really embraced uh, Series 9 yet theme ride yeah. where this guy chases you yeah. that's what we need <laughs> So which uh, cuz so you you shot some stuff in the uh in the carefully castle but how much of this was in studio like what are we watching here is this scene in studio or on location This is in studio because he leaps out the window Right So finding a location we had a location where we could leap out the window but it was it had to attach to the long corridor because there's that shot where he turns and sees the veil coming 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 and so finding a place where we could break the window and have a long corridor turned out to be impossible. So that ended up being built. Obviously, the long corridors are, are, and the circular corridor um, were built. Mm-hmm. I, I think on your Tumblr page, I think this is the scene you referred to about how um, Capaldi sort of gave you different options. He wanted to play this scene sort of very dark and morose. And I think it was you who talked with him sort of like, you know, to, to make it a little more humorous a little bit. So he does like little things, like he does a little, little mouth pop and stuff. Was it, was it was that the scene you were talking about in the, on the on Tumblr that one time? Yeah, this is a, so. What happened was we shot this scene fairly early before we had shot any of the material before it. And when I read the script, I felt like this was the scene where there was breath and humor again, rather than and that everything up to it was very very scary. Um, so, uh, but Peter, because we had shot, we were shooting out of order, didn't really know what I had planned for all the material before. So he was quite surprised when I said, I think you need to lighten it up. And he's saying, no, this is, I'm telling the scary story. And then I had to plot out for him. And because, thank God, we have this wonderful dialogue so that he was able to say, oh, I really, really see what you're talking about. But I, how would I know that if we, you didn't tell me everything um, that you were planning beforehand? So that's how I got him there. Mm-hmm. And there's just no time, because I think you said, like, you know, you had, like, maybe one day or two hours, basically, to talk 
it over with him in the midst of him shooting another episode. Yeah, I had it. I had forty five minutes in between while well, some scene was being built, um, and then one other hour on set at a different time. Where and he's still, you know, memorizing and learning and performing the other episodes, and just walks right in and does a death scene here. So, um, and it required a lot of of uh, trust on both parts to take this the complexity of the script. And represent it. And that One is, thing I like yeah. about this whole this whole sequence here, or just the TARDIS sequences, is that it allows him to act really flamboyantly, which wouldn't fit here, where he's you know in the castle set. Uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, but it just it just allows for a shift in tone that it wouldn't otherwise. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's this full on energized. I'm in yeah, my head, exactly, and, yeah. and this exciting stuff is happening, and we had a blast. Um, getting to light the, I mean, we lit the TARDIS in four different ways for this. And that was so much fun. I mean, the TARDIS set, interior set, is so gorgeous. And to be left to just play around with all the lighting in it, you just can't lose. It, it, it just it, it, There's not a bad angle in it. It's a little bit hard to shoot in terms of it being um, round and it being hard to get to certain angles. But boy, it looks amazing. Mm -hmm. uh, so what I was saying was that um, I think that uh, I've talked before about the, the falling sequence and that I had help from the uh, famous John Smith in designing a rig for the falling so that we did it all upside down um, and uh, let gravity work in our favor rather than doing wires and it was a phenomenal um, way to shoot the, it was twice as fast and twice as effective mm -hmm. in shooting that we got some material a lot of stuff that of course gets cut out because we wanted everything had to happen very very quickly um i mean in his head uh so um there's some beautiful material that was cut out um and again this idea of the, how we were able to light the tardis i just just absolutely delighted with the look of that. Yeah, the way the rounds um, turn on, like, at first, and it's just, you know, for a little bit, it was just, like, right there, that shot right there. You can just sort of, it's mostly lit by the little blue thing in the back. So was it a real yeah. letdown in, um, in Hell Bent to have to shoot the old TARDIS then, just because of the way it's set up? <laughs> it was interesting, because we were like, is this... No, because we have one of my favorite shots ever, which is the TARDIS when it's been closed down, and it's just, he, he, he walks in, and it's smoky, and um, so we found our other ways to, to make the TARDIS look amazing. Mm -hmm. And I just feel like mm -hmm. I have a, symbi yeah. a symbiosis with it. Um, all this underwater stuff um, is what was a bone of contention in terms of how to make uh, this, all the millions of skulls work, how to tell the story, how not to give anything away. Um, some of this underwater is tank work and some of it is visual effects. Uh, here we are, when he gets out of the water, we're now on location at, so part of that is Carefilly Castle. Um, mm -hmm. That's and done with a drone, and then the rest of this is clearly um, CG. Mm -hmm. Lots and lots and lots of debates over what it should look like, how it should rotate, what portion of it should rotate. Lots of times I drew my terrible drawings to explain how the wheel should work. Uh, this is a room, um, the room with the fire is a room in um, Carefilly as well. Uh, and the challenge here was that we could only show thing, only have the firelight. And um, as you can see, the doctor's jacket actually against firelight looks black. And so mm -hmm. how can you show that his jacket, it's the same jacket. You have this great creepy thing. So I spent a lot of time trying to make sure that you saw the lining of the jacket, that you saw the button, that you mm -hmm. knew the story point, or it looks like, or, or the whole point of how weird and creepy this is would be lost. And you don't, that, you don't. Go ahead, Rachel. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry, you, don't, you just don't, you don't necessarily predict those problems until you're in there looking at it saying, oh, how do I solve this? You don't necessarily say, oh my God, this 
dark, this wet red jacket is going to film black. Mm -hmm. What do we do? So that's just day-to-day -day challenges. And this is just lit from the fireplace and the outside, I guess, in this. Yeah, know, there's a little bit of sunlight coming from the from where he exits there. Mm -hmm. But basically, and Stephen didn't want any other lighting, and he didn't want romantic candlelight. So again, everything's played with um, the, 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 the you know the light has to come from the windows, and the then the light can come from places that it didn't come from. Um, Going into the parlor, for instance, there's a flash of light on the wall that would never have existed that looks cool. Mm -hmm. um, and this was based on a location that I looked at um, uh, in uh, Hearst's Castle in, outside, in Wales um, that we couldn't shoot in, but they actually shot in Vampires of Venice episode. And the idea of this room where everything pointed to this missing cornerstone so that the room, the roundness of the room, the octagonal nature of the room helped us focus on this missing um, stone. So the overhead shot's really important to me because it showed there's a symmetry and, and said clue, 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 mm -hmm. as opposed to just a random stone missing. So there's a lot of design thought and things like that. One thing I was curious about it would be yeah, the, the water tank work, which we're going to see more of later. Uh, does anybody still that, do that thing where they do dry for wet with the smoke, or is that just not done anymore? Well, we didn't discuss doing it with smoke. Um, we just did it with against green mm -hmm. screen. They don't like um, smoke too much in terms of, um, you know, it clogs up the green screen. Um, mm -hmm. It was important to me. This scene is this scene in this pantry is, um, I think, one where it's the first time you really understand what the veil is about. And it was a horror scene for me in terms of, um, in the classic sense, in the terms of I wanted it to be creepy. Um, I wanted it. I wanted scary things to be happening. Uh, initially, it hadn't been written as particularly scary, and things like the clanging. Um, pots and pans. I just wanted to uh, pull out, when Stephen said make it scary, I wanted to pull it out to be scarier in the same way that the garden that we go to was initially written as a formal garden. And um, I suggested that we make it an overgrown garden so we had textures to help make things scarier. So the horror, all the ideas are there from Stephen, but he is open to one expanding on them to make them either to to heighten what he's written and there are other times when he's so specific about what he wants that um you give him what you give him directly what he wants but in this case um the idea of this this garden had i felt had to feel it would be hard to make it uh, creepy without if it was just a formal garden and where would you hide things and mm -hmm. um, and this is this is a set as well which was difficult because in digging in the grave we had to have all the different heights of the grade of the grave and so there aren't a lot of places that will let you dig a grave in their garden surprisingly the yeah wall. so this is a, yeah, this so is a raised set then basically uh, yeah, and then we and then we built the grave completely separately as well. So there's about four versions of the grave itself, because it's and again complexity, complexity. It's written that it's covered over. It's written that it's you know that he's at different uh, la layers as the scene goes on. So we had to build different uh, versions of it, and he still had to be able to shoot him all the way into it. Mm -hmm. Is that him and digging in all the shots? Yes. You, you putting this poor man through all this digging? <laughs> uh, there's Haven't nothing, I done Peter, enough for you people? <laughs> Peter, uh, uh, you know, he's uh, so engaged um, and he doesn't want to walk away. He was on set almost the entire time. 
he wanted to understand how we were representing these ideas. And I remember when he came to see the grave. Um, so this is, you know, a partial grave before we went into the deep grave. And in the deep grave, a side is missing. And he said, oh, that's how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. <laughs> well, because he, he's, I mean, he's directed things in the past. He has, has an Oscar for directing uh, the short yeah. film. Um, so he obviously has a keen interest in it, even though he doesn't do it as often as, as he does now. Yes, it is, he's, he's absolutely engaged in what you're doing um, and in how it's working. And it also helps, I mean, he'll look at things because it helps him perform them better. And he'll look at things just because he's full on engaged in the process um, and because he's a director. Uh, but when it comes to things like just tricks you're doing, um, it's always interesting to how, how you're going to portray complicated ideas. And how do you shoot inside a grave um, without just being on the top of uh, someone's head? How do you? One of the ones I drew the most was when the veil comes flying through the grave from the inside. How do we do that? How do we represent that? Mm-hmm. And when they built the veil, they didn't tell me that they were building it to be nine foot tall. So that a seven foot, it's flying through a seven foot grave is. An inch, it, it's an issue, or uh, the height, the ceiling heights on the sets were an issue. I mean, it was probably eight foot tall, but it had a very specific movement, and that had to work with the door heights, and things had to be changed because it was bigger than you could manage to get it up the stairs in the castle. So all these logistical things that on a feature you have time to pre and uh, on a television show that it shows up the morning, the first morning that you're using it. And um, Jamie learns how to work within it immediately, you know, in, in, while standing on set. Mm-hmm. So it is remarkable how well things work because people are so committed. Now here we are in the deeper grave. Um, so that's the second set. Mm-hmm. And then there's a third version where we're able to pull the sides. It, it limits the, how big your shots can be and what you can see at all times and, that, and what you can cheat. But it's dark in this, poor, as, you, as you digs on, as the night goes along, it's darker, so you, kinda, yeah. you can kind of fudge that, I guess. Yeah, you get away with a certain amount of star cloth and you know, that, that back of the stage. Um. So I'm at the point where he's un, uh, digging out the I am in uh, 12 um, cornerstone. Mm-hmm. And um, so when I first read this, I, I, you know, I was certain that this was Clara um, who was leaving him this message. And it's, so here's the veil popping out of no place and that was a really challenging for everyone how we were going to do that. But I find it interesting that I, it's very important to me how I envision the script the first time I read it when I don't know what the answers are, because that allows me to think, what am I telling the, what is the audience going to, should the audience think at that point? Um, Did you have to like downplay your initial instinct then that, Oh, that's Clara saying that. Did you just sort of have to completely eliminate that option to sort of like wipe that from the mind of the viewer so they don't think the same thing or how do you approach that? No, you approach it that they, everybody should be a virgin viewer at all times and therefore they should think whatever they're going to think. And so that what you don't want to ever do is foretell that this is, for instance, that this is a circular story. You don't ever want, him to show that he's done this before. You don't ever want any of the gags to be given away. Um, so you have to, you look at it with the, you try and direct it with the clarity that you had the first time you read it and say, that's the story I'm supposed to be telling. And then the discovery is stronger. Mm-hmm. Cause I imagine it could get easy to get lost in the minutia of it just cause you have to, know with all the minutiae of it, right? So. Yeah, so you get obsessed with, but, but this is going to happen, and mm-hmm. so I need to foretell this, and the answer is no, you don't need to foretell anything. 
um, you shouldn't foretell anything. You should, you have to step back and now and say, how do you view this the, as if it's the first time? Mm-hmm. And where that went wrong was when we were doing the montage at the end, where the more times that anybody views it, the more they think it seems slow. And they're saying, speed it up, speed it up, speed it up. And you're saying, no, 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 no. You have to step back and say, what is it like the first time you're, see- you're seeing this, the first time that you're revealing this whole story? And if you're too fast, the audience can't catch up. It's very hard to walk that line between what you know and, and who, what does a virgin viewer get out of this. So the first time you show it to people who've never seen it, never read it, is critical. Mm-hmm. How difficult is it then? I mean, you know, most TV shows will have different scenes, different storylines sort of that you can cut around and in between. This is one <laughs> storyline that goes on for 55 minutes. I mean, how difficult was it to sort of find the pacing that you needed to sort of make this interesting? Um, well, it just sort of, uh, I, the instruction to make it scary, make it beautiful, um, and knowing how incredibly smart and interesting the story was, and then having Peter's tremendous performance, you just thought, okay, well, this, it, it, it came together because all those elements worked together. It wasn't, um, and, and probably the hardest section was this section that we're getting to in the middle where we start this montage of where he tells the story of I'm in the castle for a long time and this is what happens in the castle. And you're trying to figure out how does he feel in every single moment, in every single scene here, which iteration is this? There's no hints. There's no information. Which iteration is this? Is this the 12,000th time he's done this? The second time he's done this? And the audience doesn't know, but Peter and I are saying, what do we want to represent here? Um, These shots running through the castle where we explain this, this is all in uh, Cardiff Castle. Mm -hmm. And um, it's great because it's a totally different look. It was important not to have the castle just look like one, uh, like, uh, one stone castle and the idea that we could go in and use some of the absolutely gorgeous rooms in Carefilly, I'm oh, sorry, in, in Cardiff Castle, um, opened the visual look of it up a huge amount. So, um, and, and they were great because they took us to all the secret rooms in Cardiff and said, go ahead and go for it. Um, so I could be a docent in, uh, in Cardiff Castle now. I've been to all the, I, I know it so well. <laughs> And it's glorious. It's a gorgeous, gorgeous. So some of those gilded rooms are just so wonderful. But choosing what part of it took place in which part of the castle was a challenge. And sometimes when he's just running or he's it just it's just scripted as a corridor, you know, like, okay, well, there's this corridor in Carefilly, there's this corridor in the stage, there's this these these corridors. How much time do we have to move from room to room? How much time? Um and and all those are you know wonderful problems to select from uh but you also have to be practical all the time you're being practical what can we afford to time wise how much material are we really going to get and here we are in my favorite shot yeah. which is the soup the soup spot shot which is my uh, citizen cane homage to citizen cane uh-huh. um and probably my favorite shot in the episode mm-hmm. Although I do love all the stuff in the TARDIS. And you can see a second spoon there. I, th- I think that, you actually referred to it uh, as sort of like being an echo of all the other spoons that have fallen. Yes. Because <laughs> well, Doc seems to have a super... Easter egg, thing. Easter egg. Yeah. No, I didn't think anybody would ever catch that. Uh, yeah, because I think some people said, "Oh, look, there's a, there's a, there's another there's spoon." There's another this, person. This, yeah, yeah, that, or it's or it's dripping. There's a second spoon, one to drip and one to fall. I, I think they misread it as like a a production blooper, but mm-hmm. it was intentional. Yeah, but very. I mean, as subtle as they come, I never thought anybody would ever um, see see it. You know, every so often you're allowed to play around. Mm-hmm. Now, this, this in here, because I'm following along in the script, this actually happened before the beginning of, of the montage, before he's sitting in the chair. 
Yeah, we did a big restructuring of the montage um, because it didn't have, it didn't seem to um, push the story along as, and, and so we did do a restructuring in this area with Stephen's help to just keep the story flowing better. Um, initially, the bird didn't blow away, and we had to add that. And um, later on, when we realized that it had to erase itself, so that was a last-minute pickup with that door coming open that was created actually by the grader because we didn't have a door there, which is a little piece of genius, hmm. secrets, behind-the-scenes secrets. Um, top of the castle, very difficult set. Uh, to be able to get the veil, to be able to get up these stairs um, and represent something where the, there's enough time to, for the story to be told and yet him to be very, very close. So you can't really tell the challenges, but um, that was a set that drove me crazy. How did... How did Peter react to all this because you know being the only person in this whole thing and having all the lines and basically you know he was there on set anyway but he had to be like basically on the whole time it was it was it straining on him at all he utterly he said what who you know I'm an actor what more could you ask for than your own episode and with this much to do in it and I thought it would be difficult I thought it would be exhausting because normally you don't you either have somebody to work with or you don't have to be on set every minute of the day like the crew does. Um, but he was there 12 hours every single day of the shoot um, and just fully, fully engaged. Uh, total pleasure. And we worked very quickly because, I mean, when I went on to Hell Bent and suddenly there were all these uh, um, other people in the scene, not actors, but when you suddenly had all these um, extras and, and complexities to the scene, how do you get the extras in their um, uh, time lord outfits and stuff? Mm -hmm. It's very slow compared to saying, Peter, step onto set, you know, and he's right there and he's prepared. And so we were able to do a, lo a lot of work in a day because he was there and engaged. And, and the majority of the dialogue was just how to strengthen um, to make the veil work and how to keep you know keep him going in terms of his um, brilliant performance, but uh, it wasn't a lot of the other production issues that hold you up. There was no hold up for makeup and wardrobe and things that. So uh, it was a pretty um, efficient shoot. Mm -hmm. So that, did that give you more time to sort of perfect some of the, you know, the, the more advanced shots or perhaps ta do more takes, especially for the, the montage edit at the end? You knew, Did you know that you had to do have a lot of different versions of what you shot before so you could have some room to play with? Well, there's never any extra time. Um, <laughs> and I think, but yes, in theory, it definitely made it possible to do extra angles um, on things that would become the montage. Because we knew that we had to. I mean, it was a it, it was a difficult um, to say. Okay, well, I'm going to see this shot uh, 20 times in the future, and I need a slight variation of it each time. That, of course, is hugely time consuming, and so not having other holdups was helpful from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, trying to figure out how to justify the veils you know, how much can the veil move? What, how does the veil make its decision? Um, things like that were, were uh, also a challenge. Does it need to be frozen, frozen? Can it be semi-frozen? I mean, you know, these questions just go on and on and on. And you established the frozen bit because, the you know, the screen freezes when he first appears and the flies are frozen and... And then you say, okay, do we want to do the same thing? Mm -hmm. is, there a, is there a progression? It, it, you always challenge the audience, always make changes, always make things slightly different. And then we come to room 12 and the challenges of Asbantium. And probably the most difficult set I've had to work with in a very long time um, to try and make this plastic material look like 
um, a rock wall, a, a, a diamond wall, um, to try and make it look magical and to punch a hole, a tunnel into it without the ability to have all the different versions. Again, everything has, everything that has a progression, like digging the grave, like punching the tunnel, that's like a new set every time you see it. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that you can't afford to have 20 sets. So you're either rebuilding or <clears throat> um, revamping it a different way each time. And it's a huge challenge. Mm -hmm. And the material that was used to make this was, uh, you know, it's just a, a plastic material and it's the genius of lighting um, that makes it believable as this combination of sort of ice and, and rock. It said home on there, which is which it says in the script, but then it disappears. Was that was that an, a, a decision in the edit to sort of make the the word disappear and just sort of have it be this this thick wall after that? Uh, we never really see the height. It says home right at the top, mm -hmm. and we, there's only um, it, was a, it was an expensive effect, and so we didn't we made the decision that we were always below it after that. Mm -hmm. It's a financial one. I can make up something else, but <laughs> it's really a financial yep. one. And the nice dolly zoom in there. Um, yeah. Counter zoom. Yeah. Which, you know, used to be the cheesiest thing you could ever do, but has now become a, an interesting effect because it's not done all the time. It's also a challenging effect. Um, you, you really need a computer to do it well. So to get by hand takes mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. time. Now we've been we've been look. I know uh, I remember when we initially watched this way back when. I thought that just because you couldn't see Jenna Coleman's face at all, that that was a double. But that is actually Jenna Coleman in all these shots. It is. So um, yeah, because you you shot some with with a double, but you just didn't. It didn't look right, or. Yeah, we shot some of the double when on a day that Jenna wasn't available, and uh, it didn't look right. Um, so we used Jenna, um, and then we shot some green screen things that we put her into the one the shots that we shot her with the double. Mm -hmm. So we replaced her <laughs> into her because you could just tell. But even though it was supposed to look weird because she's supposed to look frozen, um, it uh, which she does, but it still needed to be her. So, um, and you just don't want it to be, when it didn't look right, it didn't look right um, in a way that bothered everybody. Mm -hmm. So that's a great thing is when you're allowed to go back and even and fix things rather than leave things a little bit off. And again, in one case, the grader cut her out of one shot and put her into a, a geniusly did a visual effect. <laughs> um, and cut her out of one shot and pasted her into another. <laughs> this is this is this part here. You know, Capaldi's almost crying, but he's not. But his eyes are red. Like he just he has that power of restraint. Yes. Um, were there different takes and different tries and different uh, versions of 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 this scene to like sort of play how far he could go or how far he wouldn't? Oh, definitely. I mean, he went all the way, and then we. Um, and there's also more dialogue in the script in this bit, and we cut it back. But um, he, we definitely did. I mean, Peter likes doing variety anyway. But ultimately, the pain was greater with the restraint. Mm -hmm. And the first instance of the uh, the word arse in Doctor Who. So you've made history. of <laughs> Quite shocking, even within the context of that whole scene, which was yeah, quite touching. Yeah. Like, oh, and they said arse. What? What? <laughs> and then we had the punching. And, and the punching was a huge challenge because you have to make it believable. You have to not break Peter's hand. And he has to do it a lot. Mm -hmm. So... Um, there's and you know the obvious thing. Yeah. So you, you go to the stunt guy and you go, okay, well, what can we do? And they give you these 
ideas like, well, shoot it in reverse, which never looks good. And then um, we made up these, uh, this material. We went with the effects guys and said, can we make up a material that is going to look good and that he can actually punch? Because then they're saying things like, well, just have him punch off camera. And you're like, oh, well, you know, that you can only do that so much. At some point, he has to do some punches. Mm-hmm. So there's a, in the same way that in the montage, um, that there's a variety of ways we did it. There's a wide variety of shots we did for the punches. And uh, managed not to actually damage Peter, but let him punch different materials. Sometimes there's a rubber material on the wall. Sometimes he's pulling his punches. Um, Sometimes he's punching just past the glass wall into nothing. So there's a lot of uh, play going on there to make that look believable. And of course, his acting is so tremendous that you could get away with anything. Mm-hmm. Did you ever have to run into like arm strain, like when a pitcher in a baseball game is just, just <laughs> using an arm over and over and over again, even if he's pulling his punches? <laughs> Uh, I love to ask Peter. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know, you ask actors the next day, and they always yeah. tell you that's fine. Even when they're not, I mean, unless you really damage them. Mm-hmm. Plus they it, always. Yeah. Plus, it's uncomfortable, like, after a while. Like, you, you, there's only so much, only so long you can watch someone punch something that, like, you know, he's in obvious pain because he's acting so well. There's, oh, please, just stop. This hurts. Mm-hmm. Which means you're doing your job. So. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's always this moment when, you know, when they're so good that you have to go to them and say, are you okay? Did you actually punch it? And then you know that it looks good. And then they know that it looks good. And here they are back in the TARDIS and some of the more beautiful shots of, mm-hmm. and, and some of these moments where he sees himself on the screen dying while he's uh, just some of Stuart Biddlecombe's absolutely stunning work, uh, the, the DOP. Mm-hmm. So what, what's a relate? What's a relationship like with it with the DOP on TV? I mean, do you just sort of tell them that here's a shot I want, make it happen, or like how how collaborative a, a, a process, a relationship is that with him? Um, every situation is different. In the case of this, um, we prepped together very carefully. I we had we uh, exchanged images, um, and uh, I spent a lot of time talking about uh, what we wanted to look like, and then he would come back and. Um, and then we did some testing. I mean, the, the afternoon that we spent just doing different colored uh, and played with all the lighting in the TARDIS was so much fun. Do we really get to do this? Here we are in um, the hallway in, in these long corridors. These are in um, uh, Cardiff Castle. Uh, and then back to just playing with different lighting um, in the TARDIS. And then we shot these TARDIS scenes for the first three days of the shoot. So Peter had to do his death sequence in the first three days when we hadn't built up to anything. And uh, it still blows me away that how he knew where exactly what tone to get for it. I don't so think... That, I, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say, I don't think I've ever seen the doctor this damaged, classic or new. I don't think I've... And there was a lot slog, of, anyway. like this is where your horror background really comes in because it's like it is really horrific. It's like if I was rating this, this would be rated R. <laughs> yeah, and there, there was a lot of debate on how far can we go, how burnt is he, how far can we go, um, what can kids tolerate, what is okay. And I was told go, you know, I, cause, because there's never been blood in Doctor Who, so even the bloody footsteps. Um, and. I said, where, you know, where do you want to go? And there was, again, testing. A lot, a lot, a lot of dialogue about d- little details like that. But the answer was, um, we, this should be horrifying. On the other hand, when he electrocutes himself, we, they were like, this goes on too long. You have to cut it back. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so you know, how dark is it going to be where his burned face is? Um, and they pushed for further than I would have thought would have been okay, but it was all um, by choice. It was all discussed. It wasn't me saying, take it further, take it further. It was just, this has to be um, agonizing. It really is. Man, this is tough to watch. Well, this, just, yeah. For a little kid, I'd be a little traumatized, to be honest. Yes. With you. 
it's part of why they're watching, really. But and there's no, but um, yeah, nothing. Nothing sort of just happens without discussion. Um, there aren't little arbitrary, fast arbitrary choices. These are these are big specific choices. Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, how much of his face can we get it so that it's a reveal? Mm-hmm. Um, then there, you know, we have this ash of his actually of his uh, the sand that he draws bird in is actually his uh, the ash of his body, and um, how much is it? Where is it? Doing a set with that has to be cleaned every all the time, um, and then here le- electrocuting himself. This was cut back in terms of time so that it didn't go on it still lasts fairly long Mm -hmm. but didn't want to go any tighter on it and those are choices i also i didn't think it was about i don't need to prove my horror cred so (laughs) (laughs) i don't feel i don't feel i need to prove my horror cred so i wasn't pushing it to be more gory i just wanted to make sure that you understood the story And that's some, was, go on, sorry. Uh, sorry, with the writing of the a bird, you know, people are like, oh, it looks different every time. And I'm like, yes, because it was written. How, which iteration are we looking at? Mm-hmm. How many billions of times did he write it? He didn't write it identically each time. So, and then we have the burning hand, which I've made famous by explaining that I actually <laughs> base this on a, on a lush bath bomb. Because I would, but it's like, well, we can't afford to do an expensive visual effect, and Stephen wants a disintegrating hand. I don't see why it has to be in something that we can't do. Mm-hmm. Was that relatively late in the day that you decided to do it that way, or was that like from the get-go you decided, here's how we'll do it? In the middle of, when, when we realized we couldn't afford it as a visual effect, when the special effects people came and showed me a demo that sucked we, um, and was expensive, uh, and was going to take a long time. I said, well, why don't we, and we were tossing around ideas and I suggested it and they laughed at me. So, you know, they laughed at me. So I went off and built one myself to <laughs> pr- proof of concept and then they stopped laughing at me. So there you go. It's always about being teased. It's always about being bullied. It basically well, it comes up. down, comes down to that even now. But it is sort of defines a Doctor Who. I mean, when I showed it to them, they said, "Yeah, only on Doctor Who would the director go off in the weekend and and build a you know build their own visual effects to to show it to show off how it can be done." Uh-huh. And here we are in the big uh, the big edited montage where Will Oswald yeah. takes over. So, um, just what I would say here is that. We this argument that it needed to be reasonably slow to start with um, was something that definitely needed to, uh, debate um, because the first time through you're supposed to think and it actually reminded me of Nightmare on Elm Street at one point when we did a re- repetition of the of the script right in the middle and you think it's you may think it's a mistake to start with and you have to let the audience catch up to oh, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute, oh, wait a minute. And it was the first time I showed it to one of my daughters. Where I, and I almost watched her face as the, and her commentary as she understood better and better and better what was going on. But I realized, yeah, this is going to work no matter what. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think, I think I saw some people immediately afterwards saying, you know, it was brilliant, but I don't know how, you know, children will react to it. And somebody tweeted at us, um, on the Radio Free Scarl account that, uh, that you know, I watched it with my eight-year-old and she immediately said afterwards, let's watch it again. Like, she was enthralled with this episode. The kids are smart, too. Yeah. They figure yeah. Out. And that's my argument, is that kids who like Doctor Who are generally smart kids. And mm-hmm. so, and generally going to be the kids who are interested in this anyway. So, and Stephen never panders. So, um, it, you and it, your audience, you'd either be bored very quickly or you'd be fully engaged. So, and you make your choice very quickly on television. It's easy to change the channel in television. Mm-hmm. Well, the but people if who you, made this clearly are the smart kids too. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
they are the smartest guys in the room, that's for sure. One thing we haven't talked about is Murray Gold's contribution to this. I think this is his probably his his best and and most diverse episode. How much very, is, very, yeah. how much is, did you have any discussion with, with him at all about what music to make for this? He called me after he saw it and said, this is the most wonderful. Uh, I mean, he just was beside himself. He said, I can't wait. Hmm. This is the, I told my people, this is the best piece of television I've ever been allowed to work on. I mean, it was really, you know, thank you, whatever. <laughs> but he said, just let me run with this. Um, I'm so full of ideas. I want this to be my opus. Um, and uh, so I told him, I gave him three small notes because um, he doesn't like much input anyway. He really believes that he, I mean, he, you know, he, he sees and he understands and that's why he's so brilliant. And I said, I want you to know that the ki- that the pantry needs to be scary. That's the one thing that without music won't work. So please, um, and it's not obvious if you watch it without. So could you embrace that and and help me emphasize that? And um, and then he just after that he went on and said, "This is what I want to do with the ending. This is going to be. Uh, I hope you know it's going to be classical. I want it's my opportunity to do this, 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 and this." And he went. I mean, he just set aside time and went crazy. And it's just, you know, it's just so beautiful. It is. It's it's breathtakingly beautiful, and we all listened to it and just went, you know, just it takes your breath away. You you want it on your iPod. I know. I want yeah, the entire it's hints of so much soundtrack. stuff in there. Yeah, that um, I watched. This went out um, the weekend. Chicago Tardis, a convention in Chicago. Yeah, and I watched this. I'd already seen it uh, earlier in the day. And so I thought, you know, I actually seen it on, on a preview copy three or four days before that as well. So I already knew what was going to happen in it. And so I just sort of sat at the back and just what I wanted to gauge the audience reaction. I figured I'd just sort of check Twitter to see what people were talking about it. Within like four minutes, I'm locked in. And there was such a rousing cheer after personally, I think that's one hell of a bird. And then, <laughs> and then a huge cheer when, when the reveal of Gallifrey is shown. That yeah, yeah I, I said this on the podcast. I thought, you know, watching Day of the Doctor live in a theater was, was, was paramount. I think my, my main memory of Doctor Who, that experience watching Heaven Sent was, was second. It was just amazing. You just choked me up saying <laughs> that. I mean, you know, what, what more could one hear than uh, what it's like to, to watch it with an audience like that? I yeah. mean, and, and the responses that I've had. And I, I think it's really important that one... I mean, it's really, really nice when one feels really good about one's work and that it's a symbiosis, you know, because I'm not full of, gee, I'm so brilliant. Um, It just was, how lucky was I to get this script? And then I worked really hard to represent the genius of of Stephen and Peter uh, just made it amazing. And so... um, I just, I count my blessings. You don't, you know, there may never be a time when I get a script this um, conceptual and amazing. And I love the ending. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Which is shot in Spain, I assume. We were in the, um, uh, in Fuerteventura in the Canary Islands. Right. So they're Spanish, but they're off the African coast mm-hmm. because you have to go someplace where you're going to get sun, although you'll see in that last shot that we wanted. <laughs> it was actually cloudy and cold. <laughs> but so, the, sh- so the grade, the orange grade was was hiked up. And that was a huge debate. I mean, how, in, 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 which will lead into hell bent, but how orange is Gallifrey? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. I leave, I leave that question for you. Um, you, along with the question that when you read my Tumblr, you can uh, uh, look at uh, about why does the doctor go to the top of the tower? <laughs> yes, I've ever reading that. Uh, <laughs> you, you sort of opened it up to the uh, the people to sort of ask why. I never thought about it that much, to be honest, until I read that. Then I have to start, start thinking about this. But I just want to know how Rassilon went from Timothy Dalton to this old coot. But... Regeneration, <laughs> Warren, yeah. He regenerated. Yeah. We almost had Timothy Dalton. Oh, really? Oh, that would have been awesome. We did. We did. Uh, I shouldn't say that in front of Donald Sumter, but we did go to him. Yeah. But it wasn't. But we did ask him back. Yeah. Not that he was but, Donald Sumter was bad. He was great. No. 
Yeah. But it would be no, really cool if you got Timothy Dalton. He's wonderful, but Timothy Dalton uh, uh, wasn't available for the dates. So then that's the great thing about regeneration. You get another, <laughs> you get an absolutely brilliant uh, next actor. Mm-hmm. Well, well, we'll we'll save that tidbit for uh, Hellbent, which we hopefully will be able to record with you at at, at some time in the future, uh, dear listener. We're recording this back in like mid May. You're listening to this probably in mid June. Um, so hopefully, with Rachel's busy schedule, we can uh, record the the finale, which is Hellbent. Um, but even if not, we can't thank you enough for joining yeah, us today absolutely. and talking about this. Uh, and well, I'll- I want to thank you guys because you've been brilliant to communicate with and what you've done to support me and because i didn't get to do this for uh, gallery one it's a real pleasure to just get to talk about the episode (laughs) and i was i I actually it's funny you mentioned that because during that same chicago tardis uh screening literally 10 minutes into it i i texted sean lyon um who runs gallifrey one and said i want to do a live commentary with this with rachel talley (laughs) I wanted to get that. I told him. I said I want to do it, and he said yes. Uh, and so, so when you had to cancel out, uh, it, it it hurt me. So I'm glad that we finally got this chance yeah, to uh, talk yeah. about it today. And I hope I don't sound too full of myself because Absolutely. I just I'm, I'm just quietly incredibly proud of the work that everybody did on this. Hope you enjoyed that. Come back soon for the commentary for Hell Bent. <laughs>